preacher tonight. Amen. Take your Bibles this morning. If you would, turn with me to Mark chapter 4. The Gospel of Mark chapter 4. And uh, we'll start in uh, verse 35 and read down uh, through verse 41. Mark chapter 4. And uh, starting in verse 35. Mark chapter 4. Starting in verse 35. We'll read down to the end of the chapter there. And uh, when you find that, go ahead and stand for the reading of God's Word. Mark chapter 4, starting verse 35. And it's about trusting in times of trouble. And that's the title of my sermon this morning. Mark chapter 4, and starting in verse 35. And this is what it says. And the same day when the evening was come, he saith unto them, Let us pass over unto the other side. And when they had sent away the multitude, they took him, even as he was in the ship. And there were also with him other little ships. And there arose a great storm of wind, and the waves beat into the ship, so that it was now full. And it was in the hinder part of the ship, uh, and he was in the hinder part of the ship, asleep on a pillow. And they awake him, and said to him, Master, carest thou not that we perish? And he arose and rebuked the wind, and said unto the sea, Peace, be still, and the wind ceased, and there was a great calm. And he said unto them, Why are ye so fearful? How is it that ye have no faith? And they feared exceedingly, and said one to another, What manner of man is this, that even the wind and the sea obey him? Now what I want us to notice here is what's kind of peculiar about this text is he really didn't even want to calm the storm when you think about it. Matter of fact, he rebuked them after he calmed the storm. Uh, uh, look at it again. It says in, in uh, verse 38, it says, And he was in the hinder part of the ship asleep on a pillow. He wasn't worried. And you might say, well, of course he wasn't. He was God. But, he, but what we need to realize is we're not supposed to worry either. It says again, uh, there in 38, and he was in the hinder part of the ship, asleep on the pillow. And they awake him and say unto him, Master, carest thou not that we perish? And so what he does is he gets up and he, he combs the storm. It says, and he arose and rebuked the wind and said unto the sea, Peace, be still. And the wind ceased and there was a great calm. And so you think, man, that's, that's great that he calmed that storm. But then what he does is he rebukes them. He rebukes them. He not only rebukes the storm and calms it, but he rebukes them. It says in verse 40, And he said unto them, Why are you so fearful? How is it that ye have no faith? And they feared exceedingly and said one to another, What manner of man is this, that even the wind and the sea obey him? So I think what you're probably starting to see is, Wow, that, that is peculiar. That he, he calms the storm, but then rebukes them and almost is like saying, I shouldn't have had to calm the storm. You should have just had faith, just like me. I was, he was, you know, I'm saying, he's saying, just like me, I'm in the back of the boat through the storm sleeping. And you disturbed my sleep, you know, crying to me. And, and if you'd have just wrote it out with me, we'd have been fine. And uh, so anyway, let's pray. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to preach a little message on trusting in times of trouble. Father, we're grateful, Lord. I pray that you bless us and help us this morning to be strengthened. And Lord, uh, maybe this, I guess, could be directed to our time now with all that's going on around us. Uh, but Lord, there's so much more that goes on in our lives uh, than, than uh, this pandemic. Uh, Lord, yes, this is a, uh, a pandemic that has the potential to, to affect many people. But Lord, to be selfish, there's many times in our own lives, uh, Lord, when the world seems to be up and running just perfectly, so to speak, and, and we can be having our own individual troubles. And so, Lord, I pray that you speak to our hearts and help us to realize, Lord, to trust you in our times of trouble. And so what I'm trying to say, Lord, is this really isn't necessarily about what our nation is facing uh, uh, in this time. But it's more about, Lord, what we as individuals, as Christians, uh, face in our life every day, uh, Lord. And so, I, Lord, I pray that you help us to be strengthened uh, this morning. I pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Now, my question is this. Why is it I don't trust 
And, and you might ask yourself this, or, or at least ask yourself this so we can kind of understand what, the, the, what this text is talking about. Why is it there's times I don't trust Jesus Christ, the Lord and Savior, in times of trouble? Now, I, I'm not necessarily saying that maybe you have to say that about yourself, but I almost guarantee you that every one of us is going to go through times in our lives where we'll have trouble to where we'll struggle with our faith and trusting in Christ. And that was one of the most uh, probably encouraging things to me uh, in this text was when I read that and he calmed the storm for those men, yet he rebuked them. And I think, man, that, that, that shows us that we can trust God, we can trust Christ even in times of trouble. Again, look at that verse again. Colin just stepped in there. I wanted to see this. In verse 38 again, it says, And he was in the hinder part of the ship, asleep on a pillow. Now that's supposed to tell us something. That here is the Lord Jesus Christ, and here are, here are these men who are in the vessel with him. And, and this storm is going on, and Christ is sleeping. And they have to wake Christ up. And Christ... Now, Christ answers their beckon as far as getting up, calming the storm, but then what he does is he rebukes them. He rebukes them for their faith and basically says to them, I really didn't need to calm this storm. You should have trusted in me and, and realized that I can get you through this storm. And so I think many times we look at it as, man, what a miracle that was. But, that, but the miracle really, Christ didn't want to perform that miracle. He would have been, I think he would have been happier to have a boatload of men who trusted in him and never had to have that miracle performed. It says there in verse 39, and he rose and he rebuked the wind and said unto the sea, Peace be still. And the wind ceased and there was a great calm. And he said unto them, Why are ye so fearful? How is it that ye have no faith? And so is that something that he's saying to them? I didn't have to calm the storm. You should have been able to ride right through it. And so what I'm, what I'm challenging us this morning is this. Why we don't trust Christ in times of trouble? And, and the first thing that I'd like to say is, well, it's right here in Scripture. Uh, the answers are for us right here in the Scripture. And so look at verse 37. Here's the first reason why we might not trust uh, Christ in times of trouble. In verse 37, it says, And there arose a great storm of wind, and the waves beat into the ship so that it was now full. And so one of the reasons why we might struggle not Christ, trusting Christ in times of trouble is because of the trouble itself. That means that, that something might happen, something might come along in your life to where all of a sudden your whole focus is turned towards that trouble and you forget all about looking to Christ. And so just as I said, many, often, many times, we don't trust Christ in times of trouble because of the trouble itself. You know, let's get into the mindset of the disciples here. Um, think about these disciples. When they meet Christ, um, go all the way back to Mark. I think in early in Mark, we can see, go back to uh, early in Mark, and uh, look at, look at uh, verse 14. Mark chapter 1, in uh, verse 14, it says here, Now after that John was put in prison, Jesus came into Galilee, preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God, and saying, The time is fulfilled, the kingdom of God is at hand. Uh, repent ye and believe the gospel. Now, it's, now when you go in, get into this, then all of a sudden look at verse 16. Now as he walked, and he's preaching these things, and he's telling, telling them that the kingdom's here. That yeah, he says to them again, the time uh, is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. And he says, repent ye and believe the gospel. Now as he walked by the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and Andrew, his brother, uh, casting a net into the sea, uh, for, they went, uh, for they were fishers. And Jesus said unto them, come ye after me, and I will make you uh, to become fishers of men. And straightway they forsook their nets and followed him. Now, in the process of what took place here, when you read the other uh, parallel Gospels, you'll find out that they come, uh, re uh, they reasoned in their mind, uh, and, and, and should have, that the Messiah is here. This is the Messiah. Now, what do you mean by the Messiah? He is the sent one. 
He's the one we've been waiting for, is what the Jews would have been saying. And so, so the, the disciples, what I'm saying is, you can understand why when they get in a boat and the storms are coming, that Christ says, why is your faith so little? You've always, you're, you've already acknowledged me as the Savior, as the Messiah, as the, as the sent one. I'm the one that God told you about. And so, so when you get yourself in the mindset of the disciples, they, they're, they meet their Messiah, and then all of a sudden you get the sense that the disciples think to themselves, man, my troubles are over. Now that, I, now that I have met the Savior, now that I've met the Messiah, my troubles are over. Uh, the good news meant goodbye to any troubles I might have. In other words, good news, uh, the good news meant goodbye to anything, any troubles in my life. And we look at that and we kind of confirm that there. And then you might say, well, why would you think they were thinking that? Well, then look at what they start seeing in the Messiah. Look at uh, same, uh, same chapter, Mark chapter 1, verse 21, look what it says. In verse 21 it says, And they went into Capernaum, and straightway on the Sabbath day he entered into the synagogue and taught, and they were astonished at his, uh, at his doctrine, for he taught them as one that had authority and not as scribes. And there was in their synagogue uh, a man with an unclean spirit, and he cried out, saying, Let us alone, uh, that we, uh, what, we, what have we to do with thee, thou Jesus of Nazareth? Art thou come to destroy us? I know thee, uh, who thou art, the Holy One of God. And, and it says in verse 25, And Jesus rebuked him, saying, Hold thy peace and come out of him. And when the unclean spirit came, and uh, uh, the unclean spirit had... Uh, Torn him and cried with a loud voice, he came out of him. And so here's these same men, his disciples, seeing exactly what Christ is doing. And, he, and what they saw is they saw a Savior, uh, a, a Messiah, who had authority. He could command the spirits even to come out. And then we continue to read on, and then we also see something else. Look at verse 23. Same chapters, pick it back up in verse 20. Uh, or 23, I'm sorry, go to verse 34. It says in verse 34, And he healed many that were sick of divers diseases, and cast out many devils, and suffered not the devils to speak because they knew him. And so when you get in the mindset of the, the disciples and those that were following, and, and you understand that, man, what, here's their problem. That, that when it came right down to it, why don't they trust Christ in times of trouble? Is because of the trouble them, uh, itself. In other words, here they are. They know who he is. They know the authority he has. Uh, they, know, they, they know that he has the ability to cast out demons. They know that he has the ability to heal. And so here you have these who are following Christ now saying, man, we have no worries. Now, my challenge to us, it's the same way for us. We get saved. We trust in Christ. And I don't know how many people I have encountered that when they get saved and they trust in Christ, man, it's it's bliss for a time. In other words, you get saved and, and, and you're excited about what you're learning. You're excited about uh, realizing that you have the Lord and Savior who has come to live in you. And man, you feel invincible. But then that first uh, wave of trouble comes. And I guarantee it's almost always going to happen. That when you get saved and you start serving the Lord, and I tell, I, I remember having a young man leading him to the Lord right over here on the front pew. Uh, he was about 10 or 12 years old at the time. Uh, his name was Curtis, and he, he, he uh, sat over here on the pew, and I led him to the Lord. Everybody was dismissed, and everybody's filing out into the foyer and whatnot, so I sat here with him, and I said, now, Kurt, before I let you go, I said, I want to tell you something. And I said, how do you know that you're saved? And I said, I'm trying to teach you a principle that I want you to see. And he goes, he goes, well, I, 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 just, I just did what you told me to do as far as what the Bible says. And I accepted Christ. And, you know, uh, I, I did exactly what the scripture says. And I accepted Christ as my Savior. And I said, exactly. But I said, what I, what I need you to show you is what exactly, how are you going to tell somebody else that? And he kind of was puzzled. And I said, well, here's what I want you to do. And, I, and uh, he had had a Bible at that time that we had given him. And I said, open your Bible to Romans 10, 13. So he opens it up, and uh, we turn to Romans 10, 13, 
And I said, now, now, what does that say uh, in your Bible? And so we looked at Romans chapter 10, verse 13. And I said, do you happen to have a pen? Uh, and I had one in my pocket. And he said, no, I don't have one. And so I said, turn to Romans 10, 13. And I said, read that verse. And so, I, so he read the verse that says, For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And I said, what I want you to do is take this pen, and I want you to mark that in your Bible. And so he was a little bit puzzled, but he, he marked that in his Bible. And I said, why I'm doing this is because now that you're saved, I said, the first thing that's going to happen is when you get out into this world, somebody's going to challenge you about your salvation. Somebody's going to come up to you and say, how do you know that you're saved? I said, as soon as you get saved, you're going to go into this world and the devil's going to attack you. And somebody's going to come up to you and they're going to, they're going to get you to doubt your salvation. And I said, what, you want, what I want you to realize is that you have done everything you need to do to be saved. And I took him through it and I said, now look at that Romans chapter 10 verse 13. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. When he read that, I said, let me ask you a question. Do you know if you're saved? He goes, yes. I said, how do you know? And, he's, and, and he was kind of puzzled, and I said, did you just read that verse? And he goes, yes. I said, what's that verse say? For who shall call upon the name of the Lord? So I said, did you do that? And he goes, yes. I said, so are you saved? Yes. I said, see what the scripture does for you? I said, what I'm doing is teaching you the principle that when you walk out of this building, I don't know how long it will be, but somewhere, somewhere, uh, in some way down the road, the devil is going to get you to question your salvation. And I said, what you need to do is be able to take your Bible and turn to it and, and prove to yourself and to anybody that questions your salvation how you know you're saved. And I said also this, I want you to underline something else. I said, turn to, told him, turn to 1 John chapter 5, verse 13. So we found that in the Bible. And uh, uh, I said, now, when we found that in the Bible, I said, now, what does that say? And so he turns to it in his Bible. And in 1 John chapter 5, verse 13, this is what it says. It says, these things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God, that ye may know that ye have eternal life, and that ye may believe on the name of the Son of God. And I said, so, so you've done, you, you've already said you've done what you need to do to get saved, according to God's word. Right, Kurt? Yep. And I said, now, here's why you're always going to want to rely on your Bible. Because somebody's going to question you, and Satan's always behind you. He's going to get you to question, to get someone to question you on your salvation. And I said, what you're going to have to do is always learn to rely on God's Word. And, and I said, that's what that verse is telling us. It says there in 1 John chapter 5, verse 13, These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God, that ye may know that ye have eternal life, and that ye may believe on the name of the Son of God. Kurt, the principle I'm trying to teach you is this, that whenever you question your salvation, always turn to God's Word. And, and so when we look at, when we look at the, uh, the disciples here, and we look at the little simple story that's going on, uh, here in Mark chapter 4, and we look at what took place. That here in this storm, these men who knew that he was their Messiah, they saw all the miracles that he had done. Uh, they saw him uh, cast out demons. They saw him heal people. And they saw all that took place. And yet when it came down to trouble in their life, the first thing that they want to do is turn away from God. The, in times of trouble, that's what they end up doing. They, they, they turn away in the sense of not trusting in the Lord, their Savior. We look at it again, it says there in verse 37, and there arose a great storm of wind, and the waves beat into the ship, so that it was now full. I told Kurt, Kurt, you're going to go through times in your life where you're going to doubt your salvation, or you're going to doubt your Savior. You're going to get in times of trouble where you're going to look, uh, look at the trouble more than you look at the Savior. And what the Savior is trying to tell us to do is we can depend on Him. Get it says? It says that's why He's rebuking them here. 
Because he said unto them, verse 40, why are you so fearful? How is it that you have no faith? How is it that when we can have troubles in our lives, that we won't trust the Lord Jesus Christ? And it's simple to do. I'm not chastising us. I'm just showing us what the Lord tells us uh, we can do to overcome this, you see. And can I say, life as a Christian will have storms and troubles. I'm not referring to this pandemic. What I'm referring to is the, the troubles that we'll have in our own lives and the things that we'll have to go through. And what Christ is trying to teach us is that, man, we need to learn to depend on him when it rolls right down to it. I look around many times and I, I see the trials that people go through and the pain that people go through and the sickness and the spiritual warfare that people are going through. And I think to myself, and, and, and I'm in the same boat. I mean, we're all in the same boat in a sense. That man, we would just learn to trust. You know, how many times are, are Christians ready to throw in the towel simply because of the trouble itself? And so many go right back to the world because of their troubles, you see. And the key right there is in verse 38. That we need to realize, and he was in the hinder part of the ship, asleep on a pillow. And they awake him and say unto him, Master, carest thou not that we perish? Now let me ask you this. When you're in trouble, do you think the master cares? And so, so always remember that. That when we look at verse 38, he's asleep in the back part of the, uh, the, the hinder part of the ship. Uh, it may seem like we get in our lives and we get in troubles and we almost ask ourselves, Lord, are you awake? Lord, are you here? And what we have to realize is, yes, he's here. Uh, when I think of one of the greatest psalms that it seems like everybody always knows is Psalm 23. And it's, of course, we know what Psalm 23 is. I don't know how to quote it. But it talks about how, Yea, though I walk through the valley of shadow of death, I will fear no evil. Why won't we fear? Because he's with us every step of the way. Amen. And that's what he wants them to realize. That we just need to place our faith and trust in him. When, you know, where was he, by the way? And this is, a, I've always kind of thought this was kind of cool. Um, I, I've had boats. Um, I love uh, being on the water. Uh, I had a couple different uh, boats in my life, and I don't have any right now. But, but uh, I've always thought this was kind of cool when you think about where Christ was. And do you know where you steer a ship from? You steer it from the... And I know someone said, well, there are some boats, I guess, that you can steer from the front. But do you know where the most... Uh, the, 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 the best place to steer a ship from is it's in the back. I mean, when you look at any ship, any boat that's ever been made, most of them are made where you're going to see that the, uh, the rudder is in the back and it does the steering. And so when you look at here where Christ was, and it says, it says, and he was in the hinder part of the ship. You know why he was there? Because that's where you do the steering. And so when you think about that, he's at the hinder part of the ship. He's in the stern or the transom or the aft, whatever you want to call it. And that's usually where the steering is. And so what I'm saying is, is, is when he's in your ship, let, let him do the steering. Amen. You ever, you ever seen that, uh, that bumper sticker that's on people's cars that says, God is my co-pilot? You know what I think? I wouldn't put that stick around my car. What are you? Are you, you know, anti-God or something? No. Because I want God in the driver's seat. I don't want him as my co-pilot. Because if you think about what a co-pilot is, a co-pilot is someone that run that rides alongside you and takes over when they need to or whatever. I want God doing the steering all the time. And so, and so when I think about that bumper sticker that says, you know, God is my co-pilot. No, God is my pilot. I'll I'll ride shotgun. I'll let him do all this here. And so, and so that's kind of what we're learning here. That Christ is saying, man, just let me do the steering. He said unto them again in verse 40, Who, why are you so fearful? How is it that you have no faith? I'm driving. I'm in the back. I'm doing what I need to do. 
And so, and so we don't trust Christ many times because of the trouble itself. But there's another reason, too. We don't trust uh, Christ in times of the trouble. The specific trouble. Now, because, because we don't think he cares. And that's really what they were questioning. Verse 38, uh, the last part of verse 38, Master, don't you care? It says there, Master, carest thou not that we perish? You know, you could almost just go re-preach re that same point I just preached. But, but if we come to realize that Christ came to, uh, uh, the purpose that Christ came, um, he come because he wanted to save us. And he cares. And, and so what's amazing is to think what Christ is to us. How can we say he doesn't care? First, first Peter chapter 5, verse 7 says, Casting all your care upon him, for he careth for you. And by the way, Peter was one of the ones in the boat. He's one of the ones that, that he wrote some of the most uh, prolific verses towards the end of his life. Uh, we just seen some, uh, some the other night. Uh, out, of, out of Peter and he wrote some of the most prolific things towards the end of his life and telling them to trust Christ because he learned it first hand now, now finally uh, so, so again why don't we trust Christ in time of trouble because of the trouble itself and because we don't think he cares but also because we don't realize who he is look at verse 41 it says, and they feared exceedingly and said one to another, what manner of man is this that even the wind and the sea obey him? See, they were just learning more and more uh, about who their Messiah was. And, and I don't know if they were all on the same page, and I don't know if they, they're even, they were even as advanced as we are as far as at that time uh, in their life if they un completely understood who Christ was. But we know they, they, they came around to it eventually. We know, uh, look at John chapter 1. And turn to John chapter 1 real quick uh, in the Gospels. Because John was another one that was in the ship. And yet we see, and John was probably one of the latest Gospels written. And we know that uh, at the, when John wrote this, Christ had already ascended. And we know from the beginning of John, verse 1, the first thing that John wants to do is introduce Jesus as God to all mankind. Look what it says in John chapter 1, verse 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And so when we compare that, and, and we think, man, John was one of those ones that was with them in the ship, and uh, we see what the response was uh, when that storm came. And we see what, uh, what Christ said to them, why are you so fearful? How is it that ye have no faith? And, and we see what their response is, and they feared exceedingly and said one to another, what manner of man is this? And what, what, come, what they started to realize, and we see it in their later writings, that this Savior, is God Himself it says there again in uh, first uh, or in I'm sorry the Gospel of John verse uh, our chapter one verse one it says in the beginning was the Word and the Word was with God and the Word was God and what John's trying to tell the world is that this Jesus Christ is God Himself no it's not like what the Jehovah's Witness say where He's a God no He is God. Look at uh, verse 14, it says, The Word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld the Lord, the, uh, the glory of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Now, it just, it just baffles my mind to think that when I, when I got saved, and I started to realize that when I got saved, that just like what Paul said in, in uh, 1 uh, Corinthians chapter 3, verse 16, that we become his temple. And that means God lives in us. He moved right into us. And that, and that now, that not only am I saved, I have God living in me. And I think, man, there's no greater comfort than that. 
to think that I got God, the Father, God, the Son, God, the Holy Ghost, all living within me. And, and there's no greater comfort to realize that, man, um, how could I not have faith? And how can I not trust God? How could I think that God could leave me? And there's another thing that I realized, and, uh, and it's this. God never leaves you. It says It says also in, in uh, uh, Matthew chapter 28, verse, uh, what is it, 19 and 20, is the Great Commission. And one of the greatest things uh, said in that, that verse, of those verses, uh, in Matthew chapter 28, verse 19 and 20, this is the Great Commission. It says, Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and of the Holy Ghost. And I think, God, how am I ever going to do that? You know, we got all kinds of excuses why we wouldn't want to teach all nations and baptize them and, and teach them about how to get saved. And that is, God, I don't know that I have that ability. God, I don't know that I, you know, a lot of times it's desire. But then when you start to realize, he says, this is the command, teaching them to observe uh, all things whatsoever I commanded you. And lo, then he says, I am with you always. And it says, even unto the end of the world. Amen. We were looking a little bit at the, this morning in Sunday school. And I said, isn't it something that that kind of tells us, too, that the Great Commission is not just for those 11 uh, apostles and disciples. He told them to take it to the world. And he said, and it's a, it's a principle and a, a, uh, a timeless truth that he was teaching. That he's telling everybody that accepts the Lord as their Savior He'll be with them always. It means he's not going to come and go. He's not going to leave. Can you believe I was in a Bible college? That the Bible college said, we believe that the Holy Spirit can come and go. That, that if you, you know, we were in a, uh, I went to a Bible college before I went to the Bible, Baptist Bible College. That they taught that you could lose your salvation. That, that the Holy Spirit can come and go. And man, when I, when I realized that that was not true, and I started to realize that when, you're, when you receive the Holy Spirit, you are sealed by the Holy Spirit. And that He never leaves you. Man, that, that boosted my faith. And I decided that right then and there, you know, I'll, I, I mean, I have the potential. Not saying I'm perfect, but I have the potential to never get myself in a position like they did in Mark chapter 4. That when I, when, if I get weather some kind of storm in my life... Um, I have the potential to say, you know what, Lord, I trust that you're with me, and I never have to doubt. And that's what he was telling them. He was telling them again in, in uh, verse 40, and he said unto them, why are you so fearful? How is it that you have no faith? And they feared exceedingly and said one to another, what manner of man is this? That even the wind and the sea obey him. We know what manner of man he is. He's God. And not only that, He's God that has come to live in us, and he says he'll never leave us, nor forsake us. He says he's with us all the way. Amen. Now when we think about that, Psalm 23, 4 said, Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Did you know that the words in that psalm are very comforting? But it's not the words that come from me, it's the truth that's in it. Amen. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. We can trust thee. Now, my conclusion is this. If we're saved, we got to ask ourselves. We know that we have God in our boat. But, but I think probably our problem is many times... Are we letting him steer? Amen. And are we trusting him to steer us where we need to go? And, and just like that psalm says, there's going to be times we're going to have to weather storms. But we have to realize is that, you know what he says? He's with us every step of the way. Amen. And so if you're saved, uh, the question we have to ask ourselves is, do you have God in your boat? But our problem is, are we giving him the steerage? Are we letting him steer? And, and are we trusting in him? That's what he's basically saying to these men. He says, why are you so fearful? How is it that you have no faith? 
And then lastly, in our conclusion, we have to ask ourselves too, is there a chance you can be so fearful at t these times because you don't have God in your boat? You ever think about that? Amen. Is he, is he in you? Because that's what it boils right down to. When we get saved, we not only have God in our boat, we have him in us. And so what a blessing, what an opportunity. Let's close in prayer. Father, we're grateful, Lord, I pray that you continue to bless us and grow us closer to you. And Lord, if there's someone here this morning, Lord, uh, that, that um, can admit that, Lord, there are times